I'm going to uh, cover the first portion of this presentation, uh, a little bit about how we've started uh, the project with the gopher frog in Georgia, and as well as a little bit of history on the species. So we'll go ahead and get going. Um, in 2007 and 2008, uh, the Georgia Department of Natural Resources and the Atlanta Botanical Garden began a project to captive rear and translocate gopher frogs to a restored property uh, managed by the Nature Conservancy. The property is called the, is called the Williams Bluffs Preserve in Early County, Georgia, which is in the southwest portion of the state in the coastal plain. Um, in, in following that, in 2010, the mayor's uh, lab at the World Now School of Forestry at University of Georgia became involved in the project and began to lead the rearing protocols and examine factors that could determine success of these programs as a conservation tool in moving forward for gopher frog management. We believe that the larval and metamorph stages are effective targets for overall management of gopher frogs and by rearing and reintroducing them on restored lands, uh, we would be able to reduce declines in these populations, increase their persistence throughout the region, and examine effects that could prevent these programs from being successful, as well as offering solutions to those problems. So here's a look at the range of the gopher frog. It's outlined in blue. That's Lithobates capito. Uh, so there it is. Um, the green is uh, potential range um, for the species. Uh, let's see. And the species is in serious decline throughout most of the range. Um, whoops, skipped too far, sorry. Um, they are distributed across the coastal plain of Alabama, Florida, Georgia, South Carolina, and North Carolina. Um, it's also considered in great need of conservation throughout the entire range of the species. It has been petitioned for Endangered Species Act listing in the United States. In Georgia, it's listed as imperiled uh, or vulnerable. And there are under 20 known uh, extant metapopulations, uh, which are dotted in uh, yellow and blue. Of these, 9 to 11 are secure. About seven of the known secure populations uh, appear stable. Uh, sorry, my mouse is moving things faster. So one of the goals of the project was to move animals to a new site, um, which is in this case, the Williams Bluff Preserve. And this is the wetland uh, when it's dry that we chose. It is an ephemeral wetland, which are used by gopher frogs for breeding. They don't tend to breed in permanent pools of water. Um, this is the site that we chose for several reasons uh, to release frogs in and around it. Um, in the hopes that it will be the pond that adults would return to should any survive to come back to breed. It also has close proximity to quite a bit of cover, including some upland areas with a high concentration of gopher tortoise burrows, which the frogs utilize for shelter. Um, from our results uh, so far, we saw that short-term survival was directly related to frogs finding and settling into gopher tortoise burrows. We saw that high rates of mortality during the tracking period, which I believe uh, Dr. Mears will go into a little more. Um, but the individuals known to have survived all moved into tortoise burrows. This is consistent with other studies that found gopher frogs are likely to settle in underground refugia. Uh, within a few short days of leaving the wetlands after metamorphosis. Uh, the same study has shown that frogs that settle into tortoise burrows are 25 times more likely to survive. Uh, this stands true for other species that rely on burrows, uh, such as the related crawfish frog that depend on the burrows of crawfish when they aren't breeding and they return year after year to the same burrow. That being said, for captive rearing and translocations of gopher frogs or other amphibians to be successful, it may require management of animals who provide essential habitat requirements, including the gopher tortoise. Gopher frog conservation will likely be representative of the conservation of the gopher tortoise 
that provides habitat for not just gopher frogs and the tortoise itself, but a multitude of species such as the eastern diamondback rattlesnake and eastern indigo snake, um, and which are threatened species throughout the range uh, or declining in the case of the eastern diamondback rattlesnake and uh, federally protected species in the case of the indigo snake. Some of the threats to gopher frogs, there are quite a few. Uh, disturbance of primary upland habitat. One of the interesting things particularly about this frog is that they do migrate in some cases quite long distances uh, from their primary habitat, which is in the uplands where the gopher tortoises occur, uh, to wetlands to breed in uh, the early spring or occasionally late fall during rain. Um, fire suppression in these uplands uh, and in the wetlands as well uh, that allow the herbaceous understory and hardwoods to come in and basically close off the canopy that allows um, and uh, that allows some of these open areas for uh, tortoises to survive in as well as other plants that will actually come into the wetlands and grow in and essentially suck it dry. And isolations of populations on small, small parcels of managed habitat are a big concern. Um, as you can see here, this is a satellite view of the Jones Ecological Research Center. In yellow are observations of gopher frog breeding populations. But if you look around the Jones Center, so inside the pink lines are the boundaries of the Jones Center where you can see quite a lot of green. If you look around that, it's basically an ocean of developed agricultural lands that don't really provide any opportunities for populations to uh, for populations to connect or for natural movement of animals from one population or metapopulation to another. So what did we do with gopher frogs? So we had a step-by-step -step process. The first one uh, prior to acquiring any animals was to set up outdoor mesocosms with native emergent grasses and plant material. Uh, we allowed these to mature for about one to two months before adding any animals to them. Uh, so that way there was a good kind of biome going on there. So there's an example, the upper picture is examples of mesocosms at the Atlanta Botanical, Botanical Garden when they were involved uh, in the project and below are mesocosms set up at the University of Georgia's facility. So here's a little closer look at the rearing tubs. Um, a couple of things to note, uh, water changes were not conducted regularly on these. I will mention that a little bit later. Uh, however, they were, they did have access to natural rain events. So in the top portion there, you can see there's a little bit of an overflow so that as rain filled the containers, they could um, drain naturally without overflowing as well. We installed a ball valve drain on the bottom um, just in case we needed to change water levels for any particular reason. And here's an example of some of that uh, native grass. We collected a lot of material, particularly maiden cane. Uh, it's a species of panicum grass uh, that worked very well. The gopher frog larvae would feed on it and off of it, uh, as well as it seemed to help provide a really good natural environment for the larvae to be reared in. Uh, the next step is collect portions of egg masses from our donor site, which for a large portion of the project has been the Fall Line Sand Hills Wildlife Management Area. Um, we collect, we didn't generally didn't collect entire egg masses so that we wouldn't over collect specimens. So we would collect portions of egg masses from the donor site. These would be hatched indoors in the uh, terraria or aquariums that you can see here. There's an example of an egg mass near hatching. Um, these eggs hatched indoors. And then following that, we moved on to the actual rearing process. After they've hatched, we give the larvae about 10 days, uh, give or take, inside to become mobile and start feeding. Uh, at that point, they're moved into the outdoor mesocosms where they're reared until metamorphosis. Um, generally, feeding, supplemental feeding was fairly rare. Uh, we did it about once a week um, with some prepared uh, turtle pellet diet. 
Um, they were checked every day just to make sure we weren't having mass mortalities. Um, following metamorphosis, all of them were marked uh, so that we could track them post-release. And then the release process, animals were transported down to the Williams Bluff Preserve following marking um, to be released on site. And then the next step is do it again the next season. <laughs> um, and we've done that. It's been done now for a number of seasons. Um, and then the final uh, step, which is ongoing, is field monitoring at the recipient site so that success can be uh, monitored uh, or failure um, to see how, how the released frogs are doing. So uh, to talk about a few of the key things that happened um, through the beginning of the project, in 2006 and 2007, we started kind of a test run at the Atlanta Botanical Garden uh, to see if this was something viable to do before we really went fully into the project. Uh, the tadpoles were kept in very sterile conditions, so uh, basically the same style enclosures here, except there was basically nothing provided for them, um, and water was changed daily. Uh, the concern was potential disease um, moving through or going through these. Um, success rates in this type of setup were incredibly low. Um, we had very, very low survival to metamorphosis, and a lot of the metamorphosing frogs were quite small, um, and we can't really say how successful those animals were at that point uh, upon release. Um, release numbers were also very low. Uh, in those early couple of years. We attempted in 2008 to add some filtration units to try to help control water quality. Um, this was unfortunately, we learned, was a very poor idea. Um, we lost several thousand uh, tadpoles, unfortunately, during that attempt, um, and we decided that was not a good idea. Uh, another thing we learned uh, was that obviously shouldn't be any surprise, but density is extremely important um, with these animals and with larvae in general. Um, however, due to spacing issues and kind of, uh, to be perfectly honest, us fumbling our way through <laughs> how to raise this many larvae, um, in the very beginning, our densities were very, very high, um, over 100 tadpoles per mesocosm, and in some cases, um, in the, the first two years of the project um, during the test phase, we did have some mesocosms exceeding 200 larvae. Um, but thankfully, starting in uh, 2008 and 2009, uh, we were provided a protocol that had been developed for rearing uh, larger numbers of tadpoles in a more naturalistic mesocosm type setup um, that was developed by the Mayor's Lab at University of Georgia. Um, that helped us lower, you know, figure out how to do this better. So we lowered our densities um, and conducted fewer to almost no water changes. Our densities were lowered to less than or equal to 100 per mesocosm at first, and then eventually down to 50 uh, per mesocosm. And we noticed within those first couple of seasons, uh, success and survival and metamorphosis increased quite substantially following these changes. Um, and then starting in 2009, uh, the University of Georgia uh, Warnell group uh, from the Mayor's Lab actually began to raise large numbers of gopher frogs uh, with a lot of success. And at this point, I am going to pass it off to Dr. Mayers who can talk more about where the project has gone from there. Anyone else can? So um, as Robert was saying, one of the, when we started to get heavily involved in the program, there's a couple things that we wanted to do. One was to focus on evaluating success of the um, animals that were being raised and, and relocated. And then the second thing we wanted to do is connect uh, decisions with regard to um, rearing practices and also uh, increasing rearing capacity to success in the field. Um, and one of the first things that we wanted to take on uh, 
was the issue of how dense we should raise these frogs. So we had determined that we could raise them at about 100 tadpoles in the larger mesocosms, uh, the blue ones that Robert showed you earlier. Um, but when we did that, um, the question was, we had about a 80 plus percent uh, survival rate of larvae to metamorphosis. And the question was, what would happen if we reduced the densities? Would we produce more, uh, would we produce larger frogs or frogs uh, that were sh um, took shorter to rear? But of course, we would be cutting our rearing capacity in half, which would reduce the number of animals we could release into the field. It would also potentially limit how many animals or sites uh, we could use uh, this program for. So in uh, 2015, we took um, a bunch of the mesocosms and we reared frogs at different densities. We reared them at 100 individuals, 75, 60, or 50 per tank. And what you're going to be, I'm going to show you is some results where on the, um, the x-axis here, what you have is how long it's taking them on average to get uh, to metamorphosis. And um, so I'll just show you, for example, how do I advance this, Robert? Um, do you, uh, Luis, does John have permission to advance this? Or is it just me? You will, yeah, you will need to okay. do the next slide, yeah. Okay. Uh, so, just tell me, um, John, I'll do it. Okay. So uh, what you're looking at here is, for example, the, the treatments where we had 75 or 100 tadpoles. And what you're looking at, the circle represents the average days to metamorphosis. Um, and the, the, the whiskers there kind of show you the range. Um, and so you can see that most of the frogs were pretty consistent in size, regardless of those two initial densities. Uh, but they were stretched. Their, their emergence time was stretched over... Um, about a 20 to 25 day period. Go ahead, Robert, and advance it. When we reduced the density down to 60 or 50 animals per tank, what we found is that we um, didn't have a, that dramatic an effect on the time to metamorphosis, but the variation. So most of the animals were coming out in a highly synchronized fashion, um, which was really good for us, both from a logistics perspective, but also um, it suggested that some individuals in the tank were not being limited by other individuals in the tank. The more important thing was that we increased the mass at metamorphosis. So the frogs were on average about 70% larger um, than they were if we reared them at a higher density. And as you'll see, when we take these animals to the field, this has big implications. Can you go to the next slide, Robert? So what we did is we, we have two sites. Robert mentioned our focal site. Uh, this is the Williams Bluff Preserve in Early County, Georgia, uh, down in the southwestern uh, portion of the state. And the yellow arrow on the map is indicating uh, the release site there. So this was the site that was not occupied previously, but had been restored. And, uh, and so this was the target site. We also had a second site. Um, so the next slide, Robert. So we, had a, we introduced a second site uh, a few years ago, and this is the source site that Robert was describing, uh, the Sand Hills uh, Wildlife Management Area. And we decided to take, start taking some of the captive animals and releasing them at the Sand Hills uh, WMA for a couple of reasons. One, um, it was a donor site and one of the more uh, uh, better populations we know of and have regular access to in the state. Um, but over the last decade, we saw fairly strong evidence of erratic and declining breeding uh, at this site that was consistent with more erratic breeding statewide. And so we were starting to get concerned about conditions on that site. Um, and so we wanted to start putting some animals back at that site in addition to uh, trying to understand what might be going on uh, with the declining population there. One of the things we were focused on, if you look around the boundary of that uh, site, you'll see all those squares. Uh, what had happened is about the same time we started to notice precipitous declines in breeding at the site, um, we saw the installation of an, an enormous solar farm system around the most, you know, three quarters of the, of the property boundary. And that blue area in the upper right corner of the property, that's the breed, that's now down below that, right? there you go. That's the breeding site for the gopher frogs. And so we started to be concerned that maybe some of the animals were moving, were being impacted by the development of solar off of the property. 
So go ahead and move forward, Robert. Uh, you can go one more step, sorry. All right, so the way we did this is we take a subset of the animals that we started releasing and we were fitting them with radio transmitters. Uh, the way we, we fasten these transmitters is with an external belt that uses both elastic jewelry thread that is, is soft and, and flexible. And it's, um, it's, we merge it with a hitch knot uh, using dissolvable suture thread. And so what this means is that um, after this has been on the animal for about a month or so, the suture dissolves and the radio simply drops off the frog. Uh, and what this allows us to do, given the battery life of these, is it allows us to track these metamorphs for maximally about three weeks, but generally in the field, somewhere between a week and two weeks uh, post-release from the wetland. Okay, the next slide. So uh, we would release these frogs, uh, these metamorphs, uh, at the wetland edges, um, and uh, right about an hour or so before dusk, and then we would begin to track them. And we tracked them nearly continuously, so about every two hours until uh, we lose them, or they get killed, or um, you know they continue to survive until the radio uh, exhausts. And so these are two of my uh, students from in one year uh, tracking frogs down at the Williams Bluff Preserve. We have had acoustic loggers deployed at the site, and we've also done an annual search for egg masses, and we have not detected a single breeding event. We haven't heard a single male call since 2015. We haven't detected a single egg mass in, of any form uh, since 2015. Can you go to the next slide, Robert? In 2018 and 19, we deployed a what's called a modified HALT system. This is a system um, uh, developed by Michael Hobbs. We've modified it. Uh, for frogs. And what this is, is a, it's a camera system that you can deploy with a drift fence at a wetland edge and animals can freely pass in and out of the system. And this allows us, we've tested it at two sites. It allow, it's very, very good at detecting immigrating and emigrating adult and juvenile frogs. And so we can use this to see if there's any individuals coming in or going out of the wetland. Uh, we deployed this, for example, at the um, source population site. And the photo you see on the bottom there is an adult gopher frog leaving the wetland after the breeding season. So we know this system is really good at detecting these animals coming in and out. And at our release site uh, in, at Williams Bluff Preserve in 2018, where we had this deployed, we did not detect a single adult coming into the system or a single adult leaving the system. And we have not detected any recruitment of any juveniles coming from the system. Um, and so our collective evidence is that since 2015, we have not seen a single evidence of breeding of any kind at a site, at the site, despite continuing to release high numbers of animals year after year. Next slide, Robert. So while that may seem terrible, there's this conflicting evidence. So in 2018, some colleagues of ours were surveying all of the gopher tortoise burrows on the property for a gopher tortoise project, and they detected four adult gopher frogs that we clearly produced and put out there in burrows, and those burrows range up to about 750 meters from the release pond, which is pretty typical of gopher frogs. So while we haven't seen any evidence of breeding at the release site, we see evidence of gopher frogs in the upland. And I will just tell you from my experience, if you can detect four adult gopher frogs in a, in a one or two days of burrow surveying, that's high. Uh, at very well-established natural populations, you know, detecting one or two frogs is usually a good indication. So the fact that we detected four frogs tells me there's a sufficient number of adults out there in the world, but we don't know why we're not seeing any breeding at this time. Next slide, Robert. So one of the things we wanted to do over the last few years is try and get a handle on why things may not be working um, if they aren't, uh, as, uh, as the evidence suggests, we're not quite sure what's going on. And so I'm going to walk you through some of the work we've done to try and get at some of the potential issues going on at this site and at the original site that is the donor site. So we'll take the next slide, Robert. So let me give you just walk you through this slide here for a bit, and then we'll and then it'll just kind of stay there, and we'll talk about some of the things. So on the left, what you're looking at is um, the some information about the frogs we've released. Um, Blue is the donor site, the Sand Hills Wildlife Management Area, SWMA, and pink is our release site, uh, the Williams Bluff Preserve. Um, and what you see on the graphs on the left are the body size of the frog we've released, and then two pieces of information. 
did the, what's the probability that that animal survived out to two weeks? And then what's the distance that that animal traveled before it settled in a burrow? All right, so next slide, Robert. So I wanna first focus on this issue of survival. As I mentioned before, we see that survival is related to body size at the, um, at the donor or at the release site, the pink site there. But we didn't see any evidence of a relationship between body size and survival at the, at the donor site where we have an established population. And also our metamorph survival at that uh, donor site is terrible. So it is somewhere sub 20%. Um, so I want to dissect that a little bit more for you here. So can we get the next slide, Robert? All right. So the first thing I want to tell you is that in 2018 at the donor site, um, we found about four frogs survived that we had tracked. About 15 were killed. Uh, and I'll talk about what, they, what killed them in a little bit. And then the second thing is that we had about 26 where we lost the frogs for unknown technical reasons. We had some issues where that year the materials we used for the radios was not, uh, for the belts wasn't any good. And so that resulted in um, some slip transmitters. So in 2019, we improved the transmitter uh, standard and you can see we reduced the number of unknown faded animals down to just seven out of nearly 30. But notice that the ratio of killed and survived stayed about the same. So over the two years we were working at the donor site, we only detected about consistently about an 18 to 20 percent survival rate of individuals. At the release site, things were a little bit better, which is out to 14 days, we had about a 40 percent survival rate. But I want to point out also that 40 percent is only for 14 days, and so that is not a high survival rate. Generally for ranid frogs, we want to see survival rates per year for juveniles up in the range of 35% per year. And this was only 40% out to 14 days. So, so overall, mortality at both sites is extremely high. Um, if you advance a slide for me there, Robert. Yeah, so what's killing these things? So uh, I don't know if you can hear um, that, um, but that's me uh, holding a large black racer, an extremely large black racer, using the receiver to find one of our frogs inside the snake. And it's down, it turns out that the frog is down around our hand. So what we found there is that about nearly all of the frogs were consumed within the, about the first 24 to 48 hours by um, screech owls, so those are the birds, or by black racers. They accounted for, one species accounted for all of that predation. We did have some predation by some other uh, organisms as well. I'll talk more about them in just a moment. Can you hit the next slide, Robert? So one of the other ones that is unexpected, so we have two problems at our site. Um, so at, at both, uh, at Williams Bluff Preserve, we have quite an abundance of fire ants. Um, which are an introduced non-native species, and they are our dominant uh, carnivore on the property. So they account for nearly all of the predation on the release site. We saw no evidence of vertebrate predation on the frogs um, at, at Sand Hills WMA, or I'm sorry, at, the, at Williams Bluff, but we did see all invertebrate uh, predation on that site, which was very strange. Now the video you're seeing here, those are not fire ants. One of the other things that we've discovered at both sites is that some of the ant predation is from native ants. And this is actually a metamorphic barking tree frog at our site. Um, and this is a native ant species that is normally rare, but this ant thrives in disturbed soils. And what's happening at these sites is that these, are, these WMAs and these sites like Williams Bluff Preserve these were once intensive forestry sites and they were used for agriculture and a variety of things and they've been restored. But through that restoration or it's through that prior soil disturbance, it has promoted a, a highly carnivorous ant species on the property. And so whenever the frogs are not killed by snakes or birds, they are, high, they are depredated quite frequently by ants. Uh, you can go to the next slide, Robert. Uh, we do also see some other invertebrates. Uh, this slide here is a female wolf spider uh, taking down one of our young frogs um, uh, at the Williams Bluff Preserve. And wolf spiders accounted for not a large number, but a regular number of uh, predation events on some of our juveniles. 
You can go to the next slide. Okay. So we have very high mortality at the sites. And then the other question is, what's the relationship between movement? And one of the things I want you to see in the top graph is that the biggest frogs move farthest. And so if you remember from the earlier, from the bottom slide, the biggest frogs also have this highest survival rates. And so the largest frogs are typically moving the farthest distance from the release wetland and are the ones that typically are most likely to survive. Can you go to the next slide, Robert? So what you're looking at here is this is our uh, property, uh, the, the, the release site, and the yellow or the green and blue dots are the final locations of all of the frogs that we released and radio tracked for two, uh, over two years. So the two colors just correspond to two years. You can advance the slide, Robert. And what you can see is a large, this pink area is where all of the tortoise burrow habitat is really for these frogs. And you can see a large number of our frogs are settled fairly close to the release pond. Um, and they've settled into where we would find most of the tortoise burrows. But notice, go ahead and advance to the next slide, Robert. Notice these other frogs here. These are our biggest frogs and most of them moved really far. And what they did is they typically moved beyond the area of intense tortoise burrow habitat management. And two of our frogs moved off property. They moved east. Um, this one, uh, the one farthest to the east, moved almost 800 meters in five days. Um, and it moved off of the managed boundary of the property. You can go to the next slide, Robert. Um, we did not see any frogs move off of the wing, uh, the, the donor site property um, into the solar arrays, um, but we did have uh, several frogs move to the north boundary off the property there. Go to the, go ahead and go to the next slide, Robert. So what you're looking at in the upper left is the proportion of frogs that are ended up distributed at different distances from the wetlands where we release them. And then there's some lines indicating some landmarks that we need to pay attention to. So what we find is that at Sand Hills WMA, if a frog is coming out of the central or north end of that wetland, it has about a 50% chance of dispersing off the northern boundary of the property. And that area north of the property is, even though it's not in solar arrays right now, it is not managed well for gopher frogs. It has no tortoise burrows. Um, it's, it's a very poor, it has very poor uh, fire management on the property. It's privately owned basically used as a hunting lease for, uh, by a private landowner. And so we have a significant number of frogs distributing off the north end of the boundary um, and into unsuitable habitat. Um, if we look at the, uh, the, the release site, the Williams Bluff Preserve, what we find is it drops down to somewhere about uh, 12 to 15 percent of our frogs potentially are dispersing off of the property each year by moving beyond the management uh, boundaries. So um, the, the likelihood that frogs are dispersing into the solar installation appears to be pretty small. So that currently isn't a problem as long as that north end does not get developed. But at both properties, we have a problem, which is our biggest frogs, which are the ones that have the highest probability of survival, are the ones that have the highest likelihood of dispersing off of the managed property and into unmanaged habitat that we don't control. Can you go to the next slide, Robert? Um, well, let's just jump ahead. Sorry. <laughs> All right. So, so why isn't uh, the pro pro program potentially working so far? So the first thing is, is that predation is extremely high, particularly at uh, one of our donor sites. And these, th what these two sites have in common is that they're relatively small. And this is becoming a common problem for us in managing amphibians uh, in the Southeast um, in the southeastern United States. We're typically managing these amphibians on small parcels of land that are surrounded by large amounts of unsuitable habitat. So that is bad for the frogs that leave the property, but it also means that most of our predator communities in the area are concentrating themselves around the wetlands within these small parcels of land. And that's because that's where the food is. So these wetlands are um, essentially big factories of food, insects, and, and lots of amphibians, and there isn't much um, suitable habitat surrounding the area, and so I think we're seeing extremely high concentrations 
of predators inside these systems that are constraining the success rate of um, the captive rearing and release program. We also have the fact that these are disturbed sites or historically disturbed sites, and so they have some unusual predators like fire ants and other native ants that would probably not be a problem on more natural um, systems, but are a problem on these restored sites. The other thing that we are currently trying to address is whether or not we are producing enough females. Um, so can you go back a slide, Robert? Yeah, so uh, there was a paper uh, out last year uh, working with wood frogs. And one of the things that this uh, paper confirmed was a, a study that had been done almost 50 years prior, that when the temperature uh, that you raise tadpoles is warmer, there is a higher probability that any of the metamorphs that you produce are male. And so this is something we're wondering, by raising these frogs in small uh, tanks that are sitting outside, the temperatures are probably typically warmer than they would be in the larger natural water bodies that we find um, these animals breeding in. And so we're curious about whether or not there is a higher probability of um, uh, that we're producing boys, and as a consequence, we're not producing enough females to really get the population going. You can advance two slides, Robert. Okay, so what are we doing now going forward? The first thing is we are really ramping up monitoring. We're trying to implement new tools like that HALT um, camera system to try and track breeding events, uh, whether or not we're seeing recruitment out of the system, we're using telemetry and some other experimental things to look at how vegetation management and predator management and predator exclusion may improve the survival rate of frogs on the site. Uh, hopefully that might lead to some soft release approaches to, to increase recruitment. Um, and then we're also working with the local land managers to try and think of strategies that are, are feasible uh, that they might use. So for example, uh, are they willing to go in and restore native grasses, which may reduce predation rates on the animals? Are they willing to cull some of the predator populations on the property? Um, are you know, what other actions are on the table? And then what information do those land managers need to be willing to, to make those interventions to try and improve the success of gopher frogs on these properties? The other thing we're trying to do is work on a population model that would help us judge whether or not a program is successful. And essentially the idea is if you keep doing something like this, but you don't see any evidence of success, how reasonable is it that your, that your, your techniques and your approaches to captive rearing and release are working and you've just been unlucky? Or is that an indication that something is fundamentally wrong? And so we don't know if the situation at Williams Bluff is just a bad luck and that things will turn around if we keep doing what we're doing or if something is fundamentally wrong with the system that we need to address. And so what we're hoping to do is develop a model that will help people make that decision and, and judge the likelihood of those two events. You can go to the next slide, Robert. Um, and then the last thing is we just completed an ex, uh, um, oh, I'm, I'm sorry, so what, what are we doing this coming year? So um, we are about to begin releases in another year at a third site. Uh, a new restored property in another part of Georgia. So this will give us a third uh, opportunity to see what happens to these animals on the ground. And so as we build up more and more uh, sites, we start to learn how different things can be from one site to the next. And, and I think this is really fundamentally important that what you learn at, an, at a single site may not tell you what's uh, limiting or, or, or uh, allowing you to be successful at another location. Um, one of the other things that we're going to be doing is we just finished an experimental rearing of gopher frog tadpoles and on a range of temperature conditions um, that span the range that they experience in nature and in captive rearing. And we have just uh, sent those animals to be uh, to Max Lambert, who did the original wood frog study, and he's going to be sexing them. And so within the next uh, few weeks, we expect to know whether or not rearing temperatures in our systems are inadvertently producing biases in terms of the number of males we may be releasing on these sites. Uh, and then the last thing is that we've worked with the zoo, with Robert's group, um, and Mark Mandica at the Amphibian Foundation, and we've been taking some of the captive reared animals and turning them over to them to be reared 
for uh, assurance breeding colonies so that if some of our donor sites continue to decline and struggle, we need to have a source of animals for the program. And so uh, we have collected um, animals from a variety of locations such as the Jones Center and um, Fort Benning, uh, the Savannah River Ecology Lab, and so that our hope is to have representative adults from different populations in these assurance colonies and hopefully in the next year or two we'll find out if they're able, if Robert and, and, and Mark are good enough at their, at their job to, uh, to get these animals to breed in captivity and if they have success with that then I think um, that will become a critical critical part of our program.